All right, tonight we're going to start looking at the book of Joel, one of the uh, minor prophets. Uh, minor because it's not that it's not important, but minor because it's a shorter one. It's not a long one like Ezekiel or Isaiah or Jeremiah. Uh, they are the major prophets because of the length. Uh, the ones we've been looking at, uh, we've already looked at Amos and Obadiah, and tonight we'll look at Joel. Um, nobody knows exactly when this particular um, prophet wrote these down or what exactly the period is. Uh, most of the prophets will reference a king. Uh, the word of the Lord came to me during the reign of so-and-so. or so -and -so. kind of helps us to zero in when it was written. But with Joel, we don't have that. Actually, we have no information other than um, his, uh, his family name. Um, and so really we don't have much of anything. It starts off, uh, say, Joel, the son of uh, Pethrel. The word Joel, the name Joel, means Yahweh is God. Yahweh is God. In a quick synopsis, I'll just tell you, Joel is a book that starts off by using a plague that had happened in the past, a locust plague, and used that particular plague as a sign of an impending coming human invasion and as a sign to point towards end time events. So it's like three phases. Something had just happened, something is getting ready to happen, and then something is going to happen down the line. And he ties them all in. But he starts with looking at this plague and then we will see him following that uh, description as it goes through. It appears that this was written uh, directed mainly towards Judah, the, the southern kingdom, rather than the northern kingdom. Um, some people say that this was written right after Obadiah, although, again, the text doesn't say that, but it follows in the Old Testament canon right after Obadiah. And so it's thought maybe that he was a contemporary of, or wrote this right after. And there's one or two sentences in here that are very similar to something Ob Obadiah said or wrote. But they're pretty generic that any prophet might have said the same kind of thing. So again, nobody really knows. The opening phrase says, the word of the Lord that announces that Joel is acting as a mouthpiece or as a prophet of the Lord. That's used a lot of times by many of the prophets. Uh, basically, the word of the Lord. Let everyone know, this is not my opinion. This is not my idea. Uh, this is the word of the Lord, so pay attention. Look at verses 2 through 4. This is talking about this plague. Hear this, O elders, and listen, all inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days or in your father's days? Tell your sons about it. And let your sons tell their sons, and their sons the next generation. What the gnawing locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten. And what the swarming locust has left, the creeping locust has eaten. And what the creaking, creeping locust has left, the stripping locust has eaten. All right. <coughs> I read a bunch of stuff. Man, people want to make allegories out of everything. Uh, the plain thing is he's writing about something that happened and it was a very, very devastating plague of locusts that came through. Do you realize that locust plagues aren't because a bunch of locusts get together and decide it'd be really cool to go over there? Locusts are a plague sent by God, as all other plagues are. God has control over all things. And specifically, when you read the Old Testament, even remember the passage in Deuteronomy that we've referred to with the other prophets? If you do this, this, and this, and obey, these things will happen. If you don't do this, this, and this, and disobey, here's a list. Well, read through it. And almost all of them starts, well, first thing you're going to get is you're going to get a locust plague. And then after that, you're going to get invaded. It's like, God said, and I know this is going to happen to you because I know what you're going to do and not do. And over and over and over, we see this happening. The severity of this particular play was more than anything that anybody ever remembered happening before. It was so intense. It was so devastating. And the list of four locusts might have just been 
four separate waves. They had a, a wave of locusts come through, and then you know a couple weeks later, another wave came through, and a few weeks later, another wave came. It could be four successive waves, or it could have been something like the plague. They had a locust plague that happened in uh, Palestine and Syria, and, and all the way to the border of Egypt, and it happened in 1915. Let me read you something about that one. The first swarms appeared in March. These were adult locusts that came from the northeast and moved towards the southwest in clouds so thick they obscured the sun. The females were about two and a half to three inches long and they immediately began to lay eggs by digging holes in the soil about four inches deep and depositing about a hundred eggs in each hole. The eggs were neatly arranged in cylindrical mass about one inch long and about as thick as a pencil. And these holes were everywhere. Witnesses estimate that as many as 65,000 to 75,000 eggs were concentrated in one single meter of soil. Patches like this covered the entire land from north to south. Having laid their eggs, the locusts flew away. Within a few weeks, the young locusts hatch. They resembled large ants that had no wings. And within a few days, they began moving towards, moving forward by hopping along the ground like fleas. They would cover about four to six hundred feet a day, devouring any vegetation that was on the ground before them. By the end of May, they had molted. At this stage, they had wings, but they still didn't fly. Instead, they moved forward by walking and jumping only when they were frightened. And they were a bright yellow. And finally, the locusts molted again, this time becoming fully developed adults that had invaded the land initially. According to the description of this plague by John Whitting in the December 15 issue of National Geographic, uh, 1915 issue of National Geographic mag magazine, the early stages of these insects attacked the vineyards. Once entering a vineyard, the sprawling vines would be the shortest, it would be in the shortest time, nothing but bare bark. When the daintier morsels were gone, the bark was eaten off, so the young uh, uh, topmost branches, which, after exposure to the sun, were bleached almost a snow-white color. Then, seemingly out of malice, they would gnaw off the small limbs, perhaps to get at the pith within. He describes how the locusts on the last stage completed the destruction begun by the earlier forms. They attacked the olive trees, whose tough, bitter leaves had been passed over by the creeping locusts, and they stripped every leaf, every berry, even ate all of the tender bark. And they ate away layer after layer after layer until there was nothing left. An eyewitness, a description fits what Joel was talking about this plague. He talks about, and what this, these didn't eat, the next ones ate. And what these didn't eat, the next one. And you can see the wave and the wave and the wave. It's happened before. So I think it was something like this. But the very picture of it being like wave after wave after wave gives us an idea of the immense scope of the devastation uh, that nobody was able to escape. Nobody's land, nobody's property, no, no vegetation, nothing was safe. It's like in Amos, if you remember that passage he wrote, it said it'd be as though a man uh, fled from a lion, right, only to meet a bear. Or you might have got through this wave and you got a little bit of stuff left. Or they didn't happen to touch this that was up high, but just wait a couple weeks because they're going to get that too. And they ate everything. And that's where it starts off with it. Has anything like this ever happened before? The devastation is more than you can even comprehend. And then five and seven, he starts, remember, he's telling everybody, go tell, go tell, go tell everybody. And then he lists a few of them. He says, awake drunkards and weep and wail all you wine drinkers on account of the sweet wine that's cut off from your mouth. This isn't talking about uh, 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 God going after dr uh, drunks. It's talking about drunkards or drunkards. These are people who enjoyed. This was a time of great affluence. And so if you had money, man, you got the best wine and you celebrated and you drank that all the time. It was just one happy time. He said, you start crying because guess what? There ain't going to be no more wine. There's nothing left. None. You can start crying. Notice what he says. We begin to see a little bit of a, the transition now going from the locust to 
what is about to happen with an invading army. As he kind of starts to blend, the lines start to blur a little bit between the two. Remember, one was a past event that is supposed to represent what's getting ready to happen that is right on the doorstep. And it's just like those locusts, the devastation from them was more than anybody has ever seen. When this invading army comes, the devastation is going to come will be unlike anything you have ever imagined. And he says, for a nation has invaded my land, mighty and without number, its teeth are the, like the teeth of a lion, and it has fangs of a lioness, and has made my vine a waste and my fig tree splinters, and has stripped them bare and cast them away. Their branches have become white. In the same way that the locust plague, and he's using some of the description, he's also talking about this fierce lion-like attacking army that is on the verge of doing the same thing. Verse 8, wail like a virgin girding with sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. This would be like uh, a young fiancé about to get married and the wedding would be a time of great joy, but instead she's crying because her bridegroom will be killed in this invading army. The grain offering, the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priest mourn, the ministers of the Lord. They're, they're upset. They won't have the, the things to make the, the offerings that they need to make. They won't have the grain. They won't have the wine. Everything is gone. The field is ruined. The land mourns. For the grain is ruined. The new vine, uh, vine dries up and all the fresh oil fails. Be ashamed, O farmers, wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The vine dries up, the fig tree falls, the pomegranate, the palm also, the apple tree. All the trees of the field dry up. Indeed, rejoicing dries up from the sons of men. So it's a picture of everything drying up. They've got no grain. They've got no oil. They've got no bread. They've got no wine. They've got no joy. And that's why, I mean, basically, this is a description of your food supply is gone. You will not have food. Remember, they didn't have Kroger's and food lines back then. Basically, they went out and gathered grains and oils and things and made their breads, and bread was a staple. If you have no grains, if you have no fruit, and you have no oil, you have no food. And he goes on a little further, talking about how the, the nation is to lament this that is about to happen. Gird yourselves with sackcloth. You know that when you read sackcloth in the Bible, it's talking about you put that on for a time of uh, uh, intense grief and mourning. So you take off your happy clothes, your glad rags, and you put on sackcloth. Usually it was very itchy and scratchy, uh, sometimes made out of hair. Uh, the fabric would be more like feeling like burlap on your skin. Uh, it was made to intensify your mourning. Gird yourselves in sackcloth and lament, O priests. Wail, O ministers of the altar. Come and spend the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God. For the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from, your, from the house of your God. They had no way. Grain offerings and, and uh, uh, um, the, the wine offerings that they made, um, these were normally made to give thanks to God. These were thanksgiving uh, that you voluntarily make. So nobody's going to be able to go in and make an offering of thanks. They have nothing. And he goes on and says, what you need to do is concentrate, consecrate a fast. Proclaim a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God. This is one of the reasons why I think it was directed towards Judah. Because the house of God would be in Jerusalem. Would not be in the northern kingdom. They came up with their own houses. But the prophet wouldn't speak of these as being the house of the Lord. Alas, for the day of the Lord is near. And it will come as destruction from the Almighty. When we read through the fast and talking about all of these things and everything drying out, this is also a picture of uh, judgment. They're talking about fire. 
as it kind of goes on through there. Um, fire is, re is a reference of judgment in the Bible. That's what verse 20 says. Even the beasts of the field pant for you, for the river brooks are dried up, a fire has devour devoured the pastures in the wilderness. What dried everything up? But when it appeared that also along with locusts there was a drought. And it even speaks about the, 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 the streams being dried up. Locusts wouldn't do that. Again, God has pronounced a judgment on the people. And He sent a plague to say, if you think this is horrific and this is bad, your judgment is going to be even worse. That This was only a taste of the judgment that's headed your way. <clears throat> He refers in verse 15 um, <coughs> to the locust being the day of the Lord. 115 refers to the plague of locusts as being the day of the Lord. But then also, when we get into verse the next chapter in uh, 211, he also uses the, the invading army that's about to come as being the day of the Lord. In Joel's writing, the day of the Lord refers to a decisive action of Yahweh to bring His plans to Israel to completion. It could be used for natural events, like He caused the locust to come. That was a day of the Lord. It could be uh, for the sending of human instruments as an invasion for conquest. That is also referred to as the day of the Lord. Later on, we're going to see that the pouring out of the Holy Spirit is referred to as the day of the Lord. Also, too, as we get to the end, when he's looking further down at the end times, the final judgment on all the Gentile nations is also referred to as the day of the Lord. So in Joel's writing, when you see the day of the Lord, we immediately think of Revelation. That's what we're thinking of. Joel says, no, this is any time God makes a very decisive action uh, in dealing with bringing about his plans for his people uh, and the, his people are Israel and bringing it to completion. He brings, uses the day of the Lord not only as a time of judgment but again we'll see as a time of salvation. Both of which can be the day of the Lord. So then when we get to chapter 2 it's an introduction to this future event that's about to happen this invading army as part of the, the wrath of God. And 2, 1 through 11, basically is talking about that event that is on the doorstep. It's very descriptive language used to describe the invaders, um, um, almost to the extent of, in the same way that the locusts just came and they were everywhere, he describes this invading army as the same thing. Uh, it's very, very descriptive in reading that and how they just, it's almost like they're just marching in line and just they just keep coming, keep coming. Remember, in those days when invading armies came, a place like Jerusalem, they would wall themselves up and there would be a siege and eventually they would break the siege and break the walls and just, just pour in, killing everyone. Many of those sieges... Uh, lasted for several years. So that's 1 through 11. Not a very pretty picture <clears throat> for Israel. Then when we get to verse 12, chapter 2, verse 12, you'll note that the tone changes. Up until this point, Lamentations have been, oh, lamentation, oh, sorrow, cry, probably for the past locust event and all the pain that they had endured, as well as a proclamation of the terror that's about to happen to them. <coughs> but in chapter 12, the tone changes. And pretty much for the rest of the book, there is a new light. And that light be, will be, despite what has happened in the past, despite what is about to happen, the Jews will return to prosperity. And the Holy Spirit will be poured out. And God will stand in judgment over all the Gentile nations that have been oppressing and attacking Israel over the years. 
So what's the turning point? What makes the difference in going in this direction and now all of a sudden now it's going in that direction? By definition, it's the word repentance. Repentance. Look in 12. Even now, even after what's happening, even after what's getting ready to happen to you, which I've already decided is going to happen, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all of your heart and with fasting and weeping and mourning and rend your hearts, not your garments. Now return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and relenting of evil. Repent. He's already pronounced His judgment. You're like, well, why then should we repent? Well, that's not why we repent. You don't repent to get out of something you've done bad. We repent because we know that we're guilty. That's what causes us to repent. He says, turn from your sin. Return back to me. So, you've left me. You're going in the wrong direction. You need to turn and come back to me. So we repent because we know we're guilty, not simply because we want to escape the judgment. The judgment has already been pronounced for your past behavior, for your past actions. But you need to turn back to me and repent. And then I like the next verse. 14 says, Who knows? Remember, this is the prophet. So who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him? Even a grain offering or a drink offering for the Lord your God. He says, you need to return and repent. God is under no obligation when you do this for Him to change His mind and do something different than what He says. But who knows? Maybe He will. He absolutely is not if you don't repent. But remember, the reason that we repent is to get in line with what God says, what God has called us to do, and God tells us in our minds and actions and words and thoughts and deeds. That's why we repent. We know we're guilty and we haven't been doing that. But it doesn't obligate God to do something different than He's declared what He will do. 15 through 17, let the priests, the Lord's ministers, weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, Spare your people, O Lord. He's asking the, the, the priest to, to pray on behalf of the people. Um, and, and, and the reason is, Again, you notice how many times David would pray and he'd say, you know, not for my sake, but and, and Moses was the same thing. Lord, don't do this to your people because all the Gentile nations will say that you couldn't do this or you couldn't save your people or what, you know, so do it for your sake. Well, he's asking the priest to make similar prayers, not so much for Israel, but for God's sake and what the outside nations seeing what God is doing would know that God is acting appropriately. And so he's using that, um, that there wouldn't be a byword with the nations and why should they, among the people, say where is their God? And that way the people who were watching this say that I knew Israel wasn't any good. I knew their God wasn't any good. This is what happens to them. And so pray intercessory prayer with that. Notice 18. Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and will have pity on his people. Up until this point has been Joel speaking all the way through here. Now once we get past 18, it is pretty much the words of God. God is speaking from this uh, passage forward. The Lord will answer and say to His people. Now the Lord is the one who's speaking for the rest of it. Behold, I'm going to send you grain, new wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied in full with them. And I will never again make you a reproach among nations. But I will remove the northern army from you. But who's the northern army? Well, in this particular case, Babylon. it's the Babylonians. We're talking about Judah. <clears throat> I will remove them from you. That's the short term. 
And we know that ultimately they get the, the nation gets restored. Jerusalem gets rebuilt. And so God <clears throat> says, I'm doing this. But he also says, but uh, you will never be a reproach again once I restore you. So the partial restoration that happened in Jerusalem after the Babylonians is different. And he will ultimately remove the northern army from Israel, which is what is going to happen in the end times as well at, uh, at, uh, after the tribulation period. So this has kind of a, a partial fulfillment fairly quickly. If the Babylonians, let's say, came within a year of this, remember after 70 years, they were overthrown, and then they went back and rebuilt Jerusalem. So within 100 years, they would be restored, and they would have vines and crops and grains and stuff. But the full uh, fulfillment of this is further down the road, and God is making those promises. And I will, uh, that army, I'll drive into a parched and desolate land. It's vanguard. Vanguard is the, the front part of the army that goes in first. Is I'll Spanish them to the East Sea, and the ones in the back, I'll send to the West Sea. That's uh, just a, a, an idiomatic way of saying, I'll just blow them up and just, just disperse them, and they will have no impact anymore. And, and the stench of when he defeats them will arise, and the foul smell will come up, um, for it has done great things. For do not fear, O land. Rejoice and be glad. Do not fear, O land. In 2.23, God was pouring... Well, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, for the Lord is going to do things. Do not fear of beasts of the field. For the pastures in the wilderness have turned green. Uh, the tree is fruit. Rejoice, O sons of Zion. Be glad in the Lord, uh, Lord your God. Um, God's covenant concerns have always been, when He's dealing with Israel, has been twofold. His land and His people. He is very jealous for His land and His people. And here he's talking about, I will restore the land. Do not fear, O land. Rejoice and be glad. I'm going to restore my land, the land of milk and honey that he gave to his people. And he also says, and I will restore the people. So rejoice, sons of Zion. In 23, it says that the Lord has poured out for you the rain, early and latter rains as before. And then it talks about the rain, so that makes the crops grow. Uh, the description of there, the vats are overflowing with new wine. If you remember when we had Amos, uh, the description was that the, uh, the, the planters and the reapers and stuff was being planted and grown so fast that the reapers couldn't keep up as a picture of the abundance. This is the same picture here. They keep <clears> filling <throat> in the vats of new, new wine and, they keep, and, and they're overflowing. Uh, they're making more than they can bottle and take out. It's the abundance. God says, when I restore your land, that's what it's going to be like. And he says, and I'll make up for you the years that the swarm of locusts have eaten the creeping locusts, the stripping locusts, yada, yada, locusts, locusts, locusts. And the, the, my great army. Notice he referred to the army that he's sending against them to punish them. God calls them his army. Because they don't come unless God sent them. And place that. The Bible says that he moves uh, the hearts of kings. He says, In that day you'll have plenty to eat and be satisfied. Satisfied means more than you can possibly um, partake in. And then my people will never be put to shame, 26. And then, thus, you will know that I am in the midst of Israel, that I am the Lord your God. There is no other, and my people will never be put to shame. Remember, their obedience was because they were worshiping other idols. They were mixing in the worship of Baal and whoever else and the Canaanite gods in the temple, in with their other worship. And God says, all of this is going to happen. The locust was a prelude. The invading armies and the destruction... And, and the, uh, ultimately uh, will be carried out as even further uh, when all of Israel be, will do, be dispersed and then brought back in the end times and reunited. And God just said, then you will know that I will be in the midst of Israel. And he says, and it will come about after this. Well, after what? Well, after the time that he comes in and reconciles all things. He says, after this, I will pour out my Spirit on all mankind. 
and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, but your young men will see visions. And even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my vision in those days. And I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And back in 23, remember, he says, I'm going to pour out rain to heal the land. Now he says, remember the land is the people? Now he says, and I'm going to pour out something else. I'm going to pour out my Holy Spirit on the people. By pouring out the rains, he restores the land to make it almost Eden-esque. And he will pour out his Holy Spirit uh, to call out a people to himself. Not only promises to heal the land, but his people. And I think to do with 48 when he reestablished the nation of Israel. No, because people say that that's, um, Israel has gathered back. They've get, gathered back um, politically, but not religiously. Um, God. That's not going to can't happen until after the tribulation. That's, that will be when it happens. So, are we closer? I guess that could mean it. But does that mean it's another hundred years? I mean, look how long it's already been. When this happened, the folks who studied the Bible said, oh, this is it. God has restored Israel. Here it comes. The Messiah is going to come any minute now. Well, no. No, that, that is... Seventy years. Yeah. You just brought the people back. You brought back a bunch of unbelievers. They still deny the Messiah. So you gathered a bunch of people who reject Christ. It doesn't matter where they live. He did fulfill bringing, making them a nation again. They will be a nation again. It's like a sign. But it doesn't mean the only thing that's impending that has to happen before the end times up, that has to be the rapture. Everything else doesn't matter. Nothing else really truly matters. It can be a sign, but it doesn't mean you're getting this closer or this closer or this close. The only thing that's going to be that the true sign that this is it will be when the rapture occurs. The Lord will take His people out and then the world will go into seven years of, of chaos. And at the end of that point in time, the Lord Jesus will come, the second coming. And the Jews at that point in time, the ones that, that have not repented and come to a saving knowledge of Christ during the tribulation, remember you got 144,000 Pauls out there that, that the Antichrist can't touch, preaching using the scriptures to prove and showing them the events, there will be millions of people saved and primarily I think it will be the Jews. Because it's the end of the time of the Gentiles. We're in the time of the Gentiles now. And at the end of the time of the Gentiles, that's when God pulls out His church, which primarily is made up of Gentiles, the believing Gentiles. It also has some believing Jews, but for the most part, the Jews as a nation have rejected the Messiah. And because they rejected the Messiah, God in His grace and mercy has decided He would graft in, He would break off the limb and graft in the Gentiles to the tree. Amen. And that's us. And so we're grafted in. But at a certain point in time, and Paul says, don't get cocky about this and think you're all something. Remember, remember folks, we are being grafted into Israel. God made a calling for His people. He set aside a people for Himself. People say, well, Israel's gone and now it's going to be the Gentiles. Read the book. Read the book. We are being grafted in we are becoming part of Israel, God's chosen people. We're not taking the place of them. We're being added into the tree. And at some point in time, God will then, the end times, and our studies we've had on end times and revelation, we see these passages where, of the Jews that are there, we're going to read Zechariah, where he talks about during that point in time and the Jews will cry out, uh, and, and, and when they, the Messiah, their heart will be broken. They look upon the one whom whom they they, they, they crucified, 
And they will understand, not all, no, but God will raise that scale that is on the nation's eyes and they will suddenly see. And millions and millions of Jews will come to faith and be brought in back into Israel as God had intended his people. There was Israel, a space of time, and then Israel again. We're in the space of time. In the book of Daniel, it's the, the last of the, 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 the 70 days, the 70 weeks rather. There were 39 weeks that led up. Remember, a week is seven weeks. So seven times seven. There were 69 of them that led up to Christ being crucified. And then, at that point in time, Israel was judged for the rejection of the Messiah. And I always say, think of it as them being put in a giant timeout as far as their history goes. God says, I'll get back to you. But since you rejected the Messiah, I am now going to call out Gentiles. And this will happen until... And then once we get to that last week, that's the week of tribulation. Those, those seven years, that will be that period of time. So, and then at that point in time, the Lord will come again. The Bible teaches two-thirds of... one-third of Israel will be saved. And it's hard to reconcile that when you read other places that all my people will be saved. Well, just because you were born and have a Jewish ancestor doesn't mean that you're of God's house any more than you're a believer because your grandma was a Baptist or Lutheran or Methodist. It has nothing to do with it. It has to do with your heart. And so at that point in time, a third of the Jews will be saved. Those that are living, the way I read it, those that are living there, a third, and you got how many millions and millions and millions of Jews there will be, and God will supernaturally preserve them, because the Antichrist is on a mission to kill them all. This is all he wants to do. But God will supernaturally preserve that remnant. He always has a remnant, that faithful remnant. And so we have the Jews, disobedient, they haven't done what they're supposed to, set aside, ushers in the age of the Gentiles. The Jewish apostles go out and preach to the Gentile nations and churches spring up everywhere and God works through the Holy Spirit convicting Gentile hearts in a way that never happened before. And the Holy Spirit, we were talking a little more about the Holy Spirit being poured out, and we're almost out of time, being poured out as we finish the last two chapters um, in a way that was different than how the Holy Spirit was given out in the Old Testament. God gave His Holy Spirit out for a specific person, a specific time, and for a, uh, um, uh, for a job or a chore to be done. And then, and then it wasn't there. One of the passages of Samson had the Holy Spirit on him. And remember, he got up to fight when he came in, didn't realize his hair was cut off. He did not realize that the Holy Spirit had left him. Well, guess what? Good luck fighting off all them guys. I don't care how big that jawbone is now if you don't have the Holy Spirit behind you. So God used His Holy Spirit. That's why David prayed, Oh Lord, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Because God would give it for a particular purpose, His purpose, to an individual, and then take it back. And then use it. And so that's how. But, when God established the church, those who believe when Christ died and rose from the dead, He established a church in all who would come to faith in His resurrection and place their faith in Him, when that happens, God instantly gives the Holy Spirit to them. All of them. And it's not for a specific gift for the whole time. And we'll look at a couple passages next week. The, the, the equation of the receiving of the Holy Spirit is equal to salvation. And salvation is the receiving of the Holy Spirit. The two are together. They're not separate events. Peter uses, remember his first uh, sermon he preached right after Pentecost happened and man he is on fire and he God is working the Holy Spirit was on him he gets up and he just starts preaching right there in the temple to Jews remember like 3,000 
He refers to this passage that we're going to look at about God pouring out His Holy Spirit in Joel. As this now is the fulfillment of what Joel was talking about. The pouring out of the Holy Spirit. So we'll kind of end right there. Uh, we'll, we'll pick it up in 28. Uh, most, a lot of the prophets talk about the Spirit coming. And we'll mention a couple of them. They all mention a different aspect as God is working in them and through them to explain. But then as you put all the little bits and pieces together, what Ezekiel said about the Spirit and what Isaiah said about the Spirit, you get like, he'll do this, and we get the Spirit for this, and we get the Spirit for this. Start putting them together and then see how once the Holy Spirit comes in its fullness to the church, how it fulfills all of those things rather than this one and this one and this one. So, because all of those were for a limited time. They were limited offers. So, observations or questions with that, we'll basically finish up the end of that next week and finish Joel. Let's close with prayer. Father, we are thankful for your word. Lord, we have a tendency to look at the Old Testament and shake our heads when we look at people, oh, they should have done this, and they should have known better, and they should have done not done those things. But Father, it is easy if we just take a moment and read it, we understand that we're guilty too. And Lord, we have not lived our lives in the way that you've called us to live. We have been disobedient as well. And you are a righteous and holy God. And so, Lord, when you do judge us, we know that it's fair, it's right, and it's true. Lord, when we see these judgments that come for disobedience, Lord, may we take these to heart and apply it to our daily lives. You have told us, do not grieve your Holy Spirit. And it does so when we are disobedient and it requires for you to chasten us. Father, let us live lives that are more uh, lives that celebrate the restoration that we have. For you are faithful and you have promised to restore us when we confess our sins and repent. The lessons here in the Old Testament are meant for us to accept and use in our daily lives today. Father, thank you for the words that you give us. Thank you for the time you allow us to gather as your family together. Keep us safe as we travel home and bless us in the coming week as we draw closer each day to you. In Christ we pray. Amen.